There are seven resource records you need to be aware of with DNS. There's more than that, but there's seven main ones you need to be aware of. So let's check out our DNS console. And let's take a look at a few resource records that are already here in DNS. Now with our xyz.com, a primary lookup zone here, we've got an SOA record and a couple NS records. Now the start of authority record is the first record in a zone database file and it designates which DNS server is the primary server for that zone, or hosts the primary copy of that zone, I should say. So the start of authority record also has a component in properties where we have a start of authority tab. So all this information is stored along with the SOA record. So if we check out the zone database file, we'll find all this identical information in the zone database file. And let's take a quick look. So in my computer, in C, Windows, System32, DNS, we'll have this information. So here's our DNS folder, Windows, System32, DNS. And here's our xyz.com.dns file. Now opening this up in Notepad, we'll see our SOA information. So it lists the FQDN of the server, that is the authority for xyz.com as well as the serial number, refresh interval, retry interval, etc. So all this information is also, of course, back in DNS on the Properties tab of the zone, Star of Authority tab. So the serial number tells you what version of the zone this is. If I were to add a new resource record, the serial number would increase to 15. So the refresh interval is how often a secondary will query a primary for changes. Retry if that fails, expiration date. So if, the, if a secondary can't contact a primary within one day, the secondary will disable itself. So that's an SOA record. So a second record we have is called an NS record, a name of server record. An NS record is created for each DNS server that's going to host an authoritative copy of the zone information. So xyz.com here, this is the primary copy. Therefore, there's an NS record for this particular server sl-srv3. We've also got a secondary copy on computer one, so therefore we have an NS record for that. Even though it's a secondary copy, even though it's read-only, it's still authoritative. It still has all the information that the primary has. In addition, if you have an Active Directory integrated zone, that zone information would also be authoritative, and therefore any servers hosting copies of that would also require an NS record. Another type of record is a regular old host record, an A record. So you right-click the zone and just use new host or new A record. And it basically asks you for the host name. So what's the host name? We'll just say bogus host. And we'll create a, an IP address here, just a fake IP address. And that would create a host record mapping a host name to an IP address. Now it asks you here if you want to create the associated PTR record. This would be the opposite. This would be an IP address mapped to a host name. So because of that, we have a reverse lookup zone set up, so I'll create a more realistic IP address here. So let's say bogus is .50. We'll create the associated PTR record, and it gives you a successful message there. And there is our bogus host. So there's our host record, there's the IP address, and we can check the reverse lookup zones to see if the associated PTR record was created, and yes, there it is. There's the associated PTR record. So the IP address mapped to the fully qualified domain name. So back up to xyz.com, SOA, NS, A record, PTR record. Next up is a C name record. So you right click your zone, new alias record or C name record. An alias record maps what I say host to host, or you put an alias name in which we could uh, put in the word web, puts in a fully qualified domain name for that, and then what, uh, what FQDN are we actually going to translate that to? So we could translate that to our existing server, sl-srv3.westsim.private, and there is our CNAME record. So there's web, the word web mapped to the fully qualified domain name of our server. So for example, at the command line, 
So if we were to ping our new CNAME record, web.xyz.com, that should get translated to the FQDN of the server, and that should get translated to the IP address. So let's check it out. And so this got translated to the FQDN of the server, and that got translated to the server's IP address. And so we're actually pinging .220. So that's a CNAME record. Another record you can create, you can right click and create an MX record, a mail exchanger record. This is to denote any email servers you've got. So typically you just put in the host name of the mail server, sorry, the FQDN of the mail server here. So we'll put in the FQDN. We'll pretend we have a server called mail1 in the xyz.com domain. And mail server priority has to do with if you have more than one email server, which one would take priority. So not going to get into that. We're just going to create the record here. So click OK. And then there's our MX record. Notice the fully qualified domain name and the priority of the mail exchanger record. Now, if you open this back up, notice it says it's an email server for xyz.com. And there's the FQDN. Finally, we need to talk about SRV records. SRV records are required for the use of Active Directory. So Active Directory requires a DNS server, and it requires a DNS server to support the SRV records. So to go up to another forward lookup zone we've got up here, westsim.private, we can drill down and find some of these SRV records. Now, there's a lot of SRV records in use for Active Directory, and you certainly don't want to put these in manually. So another feature you'll want to be putting in is dynamic updates. The dynamic updates of domain controller can put these records into the appropriate zone location for you. Now take a look at all these records. We've got a file in the file system called netlogon.dns. Netlogon.dns is very close to the DNS folder. It's up in the config folder. And in the config folder, we'll see netlogon.dns. Now this computer is a domain controller, therefore it has the file. And these are all the records that this domain controller would like to register with DNS. And don't know about you, but that doesn't look very pretty to me either. So that's why we like to have dynamic updates. So what you can do is do a word wrap here to see each individual record. And you'll see there's quite a few records in here. And it looks very, very complicated. It's not that bad, but on the outset it looks complicated. And if you have to manually type these in, there is a strong possibility of human error. That's why we like to have dynamic updates to put those records in.